Good afternoon. This is show number 42 for Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards as your host. I'm Jim Inkster, your moderator, and your number is 877-217-5757. Jessica J.C. Kane is producing, and we have a special guest with the governor, and that's Sean Wilson, the Secretary of the Department of Transportation and Development. That's one of the big agencies in the state, and one of the big issues in our state is roads and bridges. And we'll talk with Sean Wilson and the governor about some improvements that have been made and some miles that need to be traveled in that area. Again, your number is 877-217-5757. Before we uh, get to the business at hand, uh, Governor, uh, we lost a great Louisiana treasure in Koki Roberts yesterday. Um, she was certainly a journalist of renown in print and in broadcast, and she was a New Orleans native, a daughter of two Louisiana politicos, and few people did their job better than she did hers. I think that's exactly right. And uh, I tell you, she was always proud about being from Louisiana uh, and the role that her mother and her father played um, in, in our state and nationally. But the other thing is, I can remember even when I was young that Cokie Roberts was one of the few females that was prominently a part of national news uh, broadcast and the Sunday morning talk shows and so forth. And so she was obviously a pioneer, and I think she was tough uh, but fair. Uh, and uh, this past April, Don and I had an opportunity to sit at the table with her at a St. Joseph's Academy event here in Baton Rouge at the River Center, and she was just perfectly delightful. And, uh, and di I had no idea that at the time she obviously was ill, um, but, but I didn't know it, and, and she didn't – uh, give any signs of that, but I'm, I'm very thankful that I got to spend some time with her earlier this year. Well, you've gotten to know uh, local and national media people well, and uh, occasionally politicians have good relationships with media types, and uh, as far as I know, uh, you haven't gone out of your way to cultivate any enemies. Well, I try very hard not to have enemies <laughs> anywhere, uh, but, you know, if you're going to have some, you don't want them in the press because you, you can't, you know, they buy ink by the barrels, right? Isn't yeah, that the old saying? The old and, saying. and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, we try to maintain good relations. Well, you say you don't go out of your way to cultivate enemies, and I think some people would certainly agree with you. Most people would, but it kind of goes with the territory. Uh, when you're governor, you're bound to, to ruffle a few feathers every now and then. Well, at the end of the day, you have to make decisions, and, and not every decision is going to be supported by everybody, um, and especially the consequential decisions, mm -hmm. the ones that are tough, but the ones that you never left have to make. Uh, and so, I mean, that does uh, sort of lend itself, uh, especially over a period of time, you're going to have uh, your fair share of detractors. You just try to be driven by principle and, and, you, and be consistent and, and do your best to move the state forward um, and then hope that people will, will uh, agree with you more often than not. And when they disagree, that they'll give you the benefit of the doubt that at least they believe that you're doing what you, you think is in the best interest of the state. Well, there is an election in 24 days. The governor is on the ballot, and uh, if you'd like to talk about that, uh, certainly it's pertinent, but we would prefer to do it within a policy context, not have uh, the governor uh, opining about uh, people running against him or those taking aim at him, as happens in political campaigns. But once again, we in invite your input at 877-217-5757 for Ask the Governor. And Roads and bridges. I mentioned transportation, and you've got uh, the gentleman who has a long history in this department, Sean Wilson, with us today. And uh, Sean Wilson has uh, been at the forefront of some moves forward, and he knows the terrain well. He travels from Lafayette to Baton Rouge and back every day. Governor, we've got uh, some, some miles to travel, but there have been some enhancements. What's going on? Well, we, we do, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Wilson talk more about this, but I will tell you he is a very experienced person at the Department of Transportation and Development. He has made an excellent secretary because while we are much more resource constrained than we would like to be, the fact is we have been creative and aggressive in taking advantage of opportunities um, that, that we have had, and whether it's competitive grants from the federal government, uh, Tiger Infra Build, whether it's intercepting dollars going back to the federal governments from other states uh, that can't obligate them on time, the use of Garvey bonds and, and new procurement uh, methods, whether it's com construction manager at risk or, or public-private partnerships, he's doing a lot to move uh, transportation forward. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity. I had a lot of questions over the last couple of weeks about how is it that we got $76 million, for example, 
that was headed back to the U.S. Department of Transportation from other states. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to have Sean come in and kind of talk through that and, and about the, I think, $2 billion or so that we have invested in roads and bridges here in Louisiana. Yeah, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Jim, for having me. You know, it's super exciting to be um, in this position and having done what we've been able to do. And I think back to 2016, because of some of the things that the governor has set forth as a vision for Louisiana, we've been able to take advantage of things, as he said, we've never been able to do. We've collected over um, $150 million in discretionary grants, which mean you compete for them. Uh, and many times there's only 15 or 20 entities that get awarded out of hundreds of applications, and so we've done a good job with that. Most importantly, um, we've been able to stick to our transportation plan and do projects that have been on the books, quite frankly, uh, for decades, things that predate this governor or this secretary, whether it's the Loyola Interchange in New Orleans or the Barksdale uh, Interchange in Shreveport or finishing I-49 north from 220 to the Arkansas state line. Some really big things that we've known for a long time we needed to do. And had we had the resources, we'd be doing more like building the new bridge, but we're making progress on that. Um, a lot of folks uh, tend to think that those things happen quickly, but unless you do your homework and your due diligence, you really can't afford to just start spending money to construct something. And so we've had a huge impact around every region of this state. We've done rural uh, sustainability in terms of bridges and overlay programs. We, we're looking at urban renewal right here in Baton Rouge on the major part of the interstate system that's uh, used every day. That's original pavement from when Eisenhower built it 50 plus years ago. And so we're having some some exciting times using innovation and of course safety. That's, that's job one for us. And so um, it's an exciting time to be at the Department of Transportation and see cones all over the mm -hmm. state. Um, you know, everyone wants to have progress, but no one wants to drive through a construction zone. I mentioned the gas tax. There have been moves in the legislature, and many Republicans are supportive of this. In fact, a majority of the legislature has been supportive, but it takes a supermajority, and that is a tough lift. Uh, Governor, will anything change uh, in the the, the next uh, term for lawmakers, and uh, if you're reelected, uh, you or someone else will the next governor have b a better chance of getting first tax for roads and bridges in 30 years. Well, I look forward to working with the legislature next year and the leadership that's in place in the legislature to move our agenda forward. And, and it's premature to say what's possible, what isn't possible. We know we have a big backlog of transportation infrastructure projects. Uh, I think the, the most recent figure is somewhere around $14 billion. Um, and, and so we're going to have to find a way to make uh, considerable progress on, on that backlog. Uh, and, and between now and then, we're going to continue to do what we have done, and that is be very aggressive in pursuing every opportunity that we can uh, and creating opportunities that we've never taken advantage of in the past to deliver as much infrastructure as possible. Um, but, but as of right now, I, I just think it's, it's too early to say uh, it, until we, we get through this election cycle, we start our, our leadership meetings and, and just try to figure out where we are. Because as you mentioned, it's a very high hurdle to get over. Yes, and, but you are supported. Well, you know, I supported the, the task force 27, 2017, 2017 uh, that, that was set up in order to look at transportation infrastructure what the needs were, what the, the, the fix were, and, and make some, some recommendations. Um, and, and so we, we clearly, we have a gas tax that's 30 years old. It was 16 pennies 30 years ago, it's 16 pennies today. Um, and we know that unless we change that, and by the way, it's the third oldest in the country. So unless we change that, uh, it's gonna be very, very difficult, probably impossible to deliver the really big capacity projects that we need in Louisiana. But of course, we're also looking for Congress to do something uh, with a big infrastructure package that we want to be able to take advantage of as well. And so part of what we have to do is figure out what, if anything, is most likely to pass Congress and then what our uh, participation would look like and to make sure that we're positioned so that we can, we can take advantage of that infrastructure package uh, if it should happen. Sean Wilson, uh, you have been... Uh in this department under, I think, two other secretaries in high positions. Th three secretaries. Three secretaries in, in, uh, in the proverbial right-hand person for two of the three, I think, or maybe all three. Uh, all, all, all three, three of okay, them, okay. absolutely, all three of them. Yeah. Well, uh, 30 years is a long time to keep pace with inflation, and, and, and people don't like taxes, that's apparent, and especially in this state, uh, that's a dirty word, but 
in this case, is it a necessity? Absolutely it is, and, and I will tell you, nothing we buy today when we build roads and bridges is costing the same thing it costed 30 years ago. And so all of the steel, all of the pavement and concrete and asphalt and the pipes, it all increases. And when you think about it, the average driver spends about $140 a year in gas taxes, and that's it. And the phones we have, you're going to pay that same amount of money typically on a monthly basis. Uh, for the same type of utility, and our economy depends on it, our quality of life depends on it. We all agree that we don't want bad roads and congestion. Um, we don't like driving in potholes, and so um, it's an important thing, and the longer it takes, the harder it gets, because when you add one penny of gas tax, it's only $30 million. We're a relatively small state in terms of uh, population, and so that one cent gas tax increase is only $30 million, and that's it. And when you think about it, an interchange on the interstate is gonna cost more than that one penny. Um, the bridges we have, and we've had disinvestment in our system for decades, that is just hard to keep up with the 12,000 bridges and the 16,000 miles. And the governor was right when he said, you know, let's bring in industry, let's bring in uh, the business community. And in 2017, they gave us a really good plan that provided infrastructure investment across modes. If you were rural, if you're urban, if you're local government, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're at a port, it did a little bit of everything. While no one got 100% of what they wanted, everybody got enough to make an investment. And in that proposal, every district had something done extra that year. We would have gone from 20 bridges up to 70 bridges per year, making a difference. And our economy depends on it. And um, those states that we tend to emulate and want to say we want to compete with, they're the ones who are passing the gas taxes and making the right investments. And, and that's quite frankly what we've done. We've, we've invested in the projects we've known we've always wanted and needed. Uh, and so we're making a difference that way. 877-217-5757 for the governor, Governor John Bell Edwards, and Dr. Sean Wilson, Secretary of Transportation. John in Baton Rouge. Good, good afternoon, John. You're on Ask the Governor. Hi, Governor. Thank you for taking my call. I, my question is this. I, I saw on TV earlier this week that you said you wouldn't be worried about working with a Republican legislature, and I, I know that a lot of people wouldn't be able to say that, especially you know in, in Washington, D.C. What allows you to work across the aisle, and what are some of the things that you've accomplished with the other party that you're most proud of? Well, John, thank you for the call. Uh, so we've had a Republican majority in the House and the Senate the four years that I've been governor. And so I'm, I'm comfortable in that space, uh, and, and I know that we still have a clear majority of, of the legislature, regardless of party, uh, who are Louisianans first, and they're, they're willing to sit down in good faith and work uh, to figure out where we agree, where we disagree, and then how we can nevertheless uh, move the agenda forward. And that's, that's how we were able to solve, for example, the $2 billion budget deficit, the largest in the history of our state. Um, it, it involved a balanced approach uh, with real cuts, uh, real savings, uh, and then working really hard to get not just a majority vote, but a two-thirds vote of a Republican House and a Republican Senate uh, in order to get the stability that we've needed for a long time. And it's paying real dividends for us now uh, because for the last couple of years we've had surpluses, which, by the way, ties in nicely with the transportation. We're talking about that today because – we carved out $40 million of surplus last year just so we could get all the federal transportation funds we were entitled to, but we weren't generating the non-federal match just from the, uh, the state gas tax. So, so the, the surplus has been very beneficial to us, but also, you know, when we fixed our problems and we grew in the economy, we are able to make the investments like the teacher pay raise, the first uh, new investment in higher education in 10 years, the $20 million a down payment on on increased funding for quality early childhood education. So that's those are the things that I'm most proud of. Not that it was easy and it took a long time, but it was well worth the effort. Uh, and we're in a much better place today, as evidenced by the fact that Moody's uh, up up uh, graded our outlook from stable to positive. Um, uh, they did that just yesterday, and so that that's makes it all worthwhile. Now, in, in most cases. Uh Governors and uh, legislatures would be very happy with a $500 million surplus, certainly better than a deficit. But in, in this case, uh, there is a political component. Some people say uh, when you got a surplus like that, our taxes are too high. How do you respond? 
Well, the as you know, uh, Jim, and I hope the, the listeners do as well, we have a revenue estimating conference that forecasts revenue for any mm-hmm. given fiscal year. And it's informed by economists uh, who look at the economy and look at everything, and they try to figure out how much revenue we're going to have, and then that's what we budget to. In this case, we ended up with a $500 million surpl- uh, surplus from the year that ended June 30th of 2019, and that's not official until REC recognizes it, but it's going to be somewhere in that neighborhood because the economy performed better than the economists thought it would. That's a good thing. And, and, and we know mm-hmm. how debilitating, destabilizing deficits are going to be because we had them year after year after year after year under Governor Jindal. And so we would start the first of the fiscal year with cuts and more often than not have one or more mid-year cuts, which is terrible for higher education and, and all the other state agencies that are out there, health care spending and so forth. Uh, so the surplus means that we're, the economy is doing better uh, and it allows us to tackle some, some big needs. You know, for example, we're doing record coastal restoration projects. We need to. We can do those with surplus dollars. Transportation projects, we can do those with surplus dollars. Um, Deferred maintenance needs on college campuses, we can do those with surplus dollars. And we have to put at least 25% in the rainy day fund, which, by the way, when we put that 25% Mm -hmm. in the rainy day fund, this this year, $125 million, the fund will have more in it than it did when I became governor. Uh, and, and so that's a positive thing, and we're also paid towards our pension liabilities, too. Ben in New Orleans, you're on Ask the Governor. Ben, good, good afternoon to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Governor, um, I live in the Treme area, and uh, I've been hearing about the uh, Claiborne Corridor, I-10, uh, tearing down the I-10 and maybe uh, building the 610 at the Legion Field split go around the city and revitalizing the Claiborne Corridor in that area and bringing streetcars back and bringing it back to the old oak tree. Uh, I believe it was UNO did a five-year study. That study has been completed. I haven't heard anything more on that. And incidentally, um, back when that that I-10 was built, uh, we had a lot of brake shoes that was made, created with asbestos, and it basically blanketed my neighborhood. Uh, All right. Uh, would you respond, Sean? Wilson? Yeah, I'm going to let Secretary Wilson respond, Ben. But thank you so much for the call. Yeah. So, 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 Ben, thank you for that. I will tell you, 50 years ago, when we built interstates, we didn't do it the smartest way possible. We put them through neighborhoods, tore up communities, and we built this massive infrastructure. No one thought about what it's going to cost to revitalize that, or to bring it down, or to expand under there. Our challenge isn't with finding the right way to do it and the ideas and the way to manage traffic and uh, make it more mobile for folks who are walking or biking uh, or want to live in and around that area. Our challenge is how would we pay for that? That would be a massively um, expensive process, and, and quite frankly, we're dealing with it all around the country where the infrastructure you see is 55 years old and it was made to live mm-hmm. 50 years, you know, 50 years of utility. Our challenge is, is always working with locals. We have a great relationship with RPC uh, and a lot of the community groups. We've actually shared property uh, with some of the entities in that region to be able to use it for public good with parks and other facilities. While it's not ideal, um, we struggle in this state with how do we pay for it because we have enough money barely to maintain what's already built, let alone go out and build new infrastructure. Lila in New Orleans. Lila, good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor. Hi there, Governor. Um, I know that the first debate is tomorrow, so I really appreciate the, you taking the time to do the show today. And I wanted to ask how you're feeling about the debate, and just do you ever get nervous for these events or appearances like this? Lala, thank you for the call. <laughs> you know, I- anytime, you know, whether I'm on this radio program or, or doing a, especially a live event like uh, uh, the debates, you know, I, there's always a little bit of anxiety uh, or, or, you know, uh, but it, at the end of the day, it's, it's, I think it's just a normal process. And, and quickly, once the event starts, um, then, then, you know, things settle down and, and you're fully engaged. And before you know it, the hour is gone. And that's the way this radio program has been for 42 times. And that's what I expect will likely happen tomorrow night uh, between 7 and 8 
when we do the debate from uh, LSU. Graham and Ponchatoula. Hi, Graham. You're on Ask the Governor. Good afternoon. Hi, um, I have a question. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I was wondering what their thoughts on um, what the local, um, what they thought the roles and responsibilities of local governments are uh, for local traffic not to overwhelm the interstate system. You know, that's that's always a struggle because depending on the capacity of that local system, folks will flood the interstates. And we like to say 80 percent of the traffic travels on 20 percent of the roads. And that's that's pretty much accurate when you look at uh, what happens here in Louisiana. Uh, we work very well with local government. We support them. We give them at least a penny of our gas tax uh, from every 16 cents and they actually get a little bit more than a penny to help fund uh, parish roads and parish infrastructure, and it's a good collaborative relationships. The folks in our districts, we've got 4,200 people in the entire state working on transportation. 3,000 plus of them are actually on the ground working with local government officials on traffic and transportation issues. And so we work well together, and a lot of it depends on resources. And Graham, uh, we actually, uh, from the State Transportation Trust Fund, we give the local government twice what the Constitution requires us to give uh, for infrastructure. And we do that even though when I inherited that deficit, a lot of my advisors and people around the state thought we should cut it back to what's prescribed in the Constitution as a way to save money. But I didn't do that because, one, I promised not to balance a budget on the backs of local government. But secondly, that same Constitution greatly limits how the, the local governments can raise money for infrastructure. Um, and so in order to help, we actually fund uh, that amount at twice what is required. Um, and I think that's very helpful. And I know you're in Tangeville Parish, but for whatever parish that, that's and it's And it's actually more than that even now, Governor, since we've doubled the highway, I'm sorry, the uh, statewide flood control program. Yes. That's up to $20 million. And in 2017, the proposal that the task force <coughs> talked about <coughs> brought that to $100 million a year going to local governments for local roads. Right. Linda in New Orleans. Uh, thanks for your patience, Linda. You're on the air with Governor Edwards and Sean Wilson. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, Governor Edwards, I have sort of a two-parter for you uh, that ha has to do with early voting beginning next week. And the first question is that I'm curious to know if you vote early or if you prefer to vote on Election Day. And the second part of this question, or the second question, what do you think is the biggest reason people should vote early? Well, Linda, thank you. So Donna and I have started voting early. Um, you know, back when it was called absentee voting, you, you had to have a good reason not to vote on Election Day. But now that we've made a conscious decision to have seven full days of early voting uh, and an Election Day, uh, it's just it's just easier to vote early for us because it's easier to schedule it. Secondly, and I think this gets to the second answer, we vote early because you never know what's going to happen on uh, election day. You don't know what the weather's going to be like. You don't know what might intervene. You know, because sometimes life gets in the way, and you, you know whatever that might be. Um, and so I, I encourage people to vote early. Vote, registering to vote has never been easier than it is today, and voting has never been easier than it is today. Um, and, and I just believe that, that uh, we, we know we have a right to participate in the process. I think we have a responsibility, uh, and early voting makes it much easier for us to, to live up to that responsibility. There are some football games on October 12th. Oh, yeah, LSU homecoming, for example, against Florida, <laughs> the first time in three years. Uh, that Florida will come to Baton Rouge, and, and uh, that's that's going to be an exciting game. And that could be part of life that that's gets in true. the way for that's some true. people. And, uh, Governor, I think most of the state's in mourning over the injury to Drew Brees. Yeah. You, Your ex-quarterback, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I am as well. And, and, of course, I'm always optimistic, and I think Sean Payton is going to be able to coach our, our other quarterbacks, uh, Teddy Bridgewater and Taysom Hill, and get them ready to play. But, but you know, it's – the, we can't pretend that it's going to be easy to replace uh, Drew Brees, and, and I do hope he has a speedy recovery and is back uh, later this year and that we win some games between now and then. Subash in Baton Rouge. Subash, you're on the air with the governor. Good afternoon, Mr. Governor, Mr. Wilson, and Mr. Engster. I have a comment and a request. My comment is we Louisianians must thank our stars 
for having you as our governor, especially after the Jindal disaster. And my request is, I wish we have a reasonably good speed train system between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Uh, th thank you very much for the call. I, I will tell you, if we had a uh, passenger rail uh, that would link Baton Rouge and New Orleans, uh, what we could do is then have the Twin Cities uh, compete as a region together against other parts of the country as opposed to maybe having the competition that we currently have between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. If you could live in Baton Rouge and, and work in New Orleans or live in New Orleans and, and entertain in Baton Rouge and you did it all by rail, um, I, I think it would, it would make a, a tremendous difference and it would get a lot of traffic off of the interstate. Um, but, but that is an expensive proposition. We are... We are uh, pursuing opportunities there, but, but they're slow to develop. I'm going to let Sean address that. Yeah, thank you, Governor. And I, I will tell you, we have done a couple of things to try and move the ball forward on this, everything from uh, courting public-private partnerships, if you will, and being active in the Southern Rail Commission, which is a three-state uh, commission that actually just received some federal funding uh, to begin a much more comprehensive effort. Uh, we dedicated money uh, to this quarter uh, from an environmental standpoint in the very early part of this administration and are working diligently with uh, the private railroad industry to uh, try and leverage what resources they have. That's not an easy discussion, uh, but we agree with you. Passenger rail and commuter rail is absolutely essential uh, for Baton Rouge to New Orleans as well as all along the Gulf Coast. Andrew and Zachary. Good afternoon, Andrew. You're on Ask the Governor. Governor Edwards, thank you for taking my call. Um, I have a two-part question for you. Uh, the first part of the question is, when I moved from Texas back to the state of Louisiana after completing my education a few years ago, my car insurance doubled. Um, so the first part of the question is, what measures do you plan to, uh, to take um, to lower car insurance premiums? The second part of the question is related to that and also the gas tax that you propose. Um, I am curious if your thoughts, um, if you were able to take some measures to lower auto insurance rates, if that might would make your gas tax more palatable um, for the population. Thank you. Yeah, the, the second one uh, first, I'm, I'm not sure whether that would play into um, the, the overall conversation and, and, and effort uh, with respect to addressing the transportation infrastructure funding or not. Uh, first of all, glad to have you back in Louisiana from, from Texas. There has been some good news uh, recently. State Farm uh, announced its third rate decrease in about a year, and other insurers have followed suit uh, as well. Uh, so car insurance, auto insurance premiums, I should say, are actually declining, but they're still very uh, expensive, and, and, and I get it. Um, one of the things that we, I think we can do is do a much better job of regulating insurance in the state of Louisiana and base premiums on driving records and not on things like credit scores. Um, a widow shouldn't pay more for car insurance uh, than she did before her husband died, for example. Uh, a blue-collar worker shouldn't pay more uh, than a white-collar worker when the blue-collar worker has a superior driving record uh, and they have the same car and the same insurance policy. And, and all of those things are happening. We should stop it. I also think that there's, there's some areas where we can get agreement. There was an opportunity this year in the legislature, for example, to have a compromise bill uh, pass that would have done at least two of the things that the, uh, the so-called Ominous Premium Reduction Act uh, attempted to do with five separate components. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't possible to get the uh, agreement uh, to do a compromise uh, on that. But I do think it's something that we can do. And, and I'm committed to working uh, and, and creating a, a, a small working group uh, of diverse folks to sit down at the table and plot a path forward uh, that we can move along uh, that, that should have uh, the, at least give insurance companies the, the possibility of, of lowering premiums uh, significantly. Jesse in Metairie. Hello, Jesse. You're on the air with Governor Edwards and Secretary Wilson. Hi, Jesse. Hi. I was calling to ask about the property tax exemptions given to corporations. I know in Louisiana, um, corporations come here and they pay just a huge percentage less in property taxes than they do in every other state in the country. I'm wondering if there's any plan to kind of even that playing field out a little bit because that's a lot of revenue that can go to our, to our state. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jesse, for the call. So 
property taxes all go to local government. The state doesn't participate in any property tax. But your point is well taken. And, it's, and it, we have a, a very generous program called the Industrial Tax Exemption Program that benefits manufacturers. Um, we have changed it under uh, my administration. So rather than 100% for 10 years, it's now capped at 80% for 10 years. It's tied to jobs, and locals get to sit and decide whether they're going to be granted. And James in Longview, Texas. Good afternoon, James. You're on the air. Good to hear from you. Well, good afternoon, Jim, and good afternoon, Governor Edwards. Thank you, James. Anyhow, basically, I, you touched on a, a topic just a very briefly, and I just was hoping you would expand a little on it. Uh, you were mentioning the good news, and I read about it myself, about uh, Moody's improving the credit rating for the state of Louisiana. And my question is, do you expect that improvement to continue? In my view, it, it should boost uh, investment and and growth in Louisiana, and what are your thoughts long-term as far as it happening again and again, hopefully? Well, with the with the stable revenue, and, and quite frankly, not just the revenue, but we have jettisoned all of the really bad budgeting practices of my predecessor, where we just loaded the budget up with one-time money against recurring expenditures. We were rating trust funds and so forth. It just didn't make any sense. Um, but with all the work that we've done, uh, Moody's is paying attention. And it wasn't actually the credit rating that got updated. It's the credit outlook. It moved from stable to positive. And what typically would happen now is at some point in the not-too-distant future, Moody's would actually improve the credit rating. And that allows you to immediately start saving money on the debt that you are servicing. Um, and, you know, the other thing that Moody's paid attention to is they praised Louisiana for our response to the cyber uh, security attacks that, that we got uh, in Louisiana for, with school districts and, and so forth around the state, but also the higher education master plan um, uh, was praised by Moody uh, as being really innovative and forward thinking and, and one that would absolutely grow our economy over time upon implementation. So this this is all very positive for the state of Louisiana um, and, and the, the surplus, the third consecutive surplus uh, after having uh, deficits annually for many years is really what fueled, I think, um, uh, Moody's to actually take another look at Louisiana and, and, and make that um, update on the outlook. Michael in Lake Charles. Hello, Michael. You're on the air with Governor Edwards. Hi, Jim. Uh, Governor, I just want to ask you about, I saw where the uh, uh, Louisiana Sheriff's Association endorsed you, and uh, I, I just, if you maybe speak to why you think they endorsed you and I guess kind of what that means to you, and I guess just kind of your general feelings about law enforcement. Well, Michael, thank you. So that happened this morning, and I appreciate your call. Um, the Sheriff's Association meeting in Alexandria voted to endorse me for re-election in this governor's race. Uh, it means a lot to me because my brother is my sheriff. My dad was my sheriff. You know, my grandfather and great-grandfather before that. So I have tremendous affection for law enforcement in general, but but for sheriffs in particular. Uh, but but I know how hard I've worked with the association and with individual sheriffs uh, in order to improve public safety across the state of Louisiana. Um, and we've been able to do that. Um, and quite frankly, it was through the criminal justice reform uh, measures that, that I signed in law in 2017. And in the first year since then, um, in 2018, for example, the number of murders in New Orleans, the lowest since 1971. And they're on track right now to be a third below that in the current year. Uh, similar reductions in Baton Rouge, in Monroe, in Alexandria, Shreveport, Lafayette, I think, had uh, over a 50 percent decline. Um, and so there's one real reason to do criminal justice reform, and that is to be safer um, and, and to have lower crime rates, lower recidivism rates. And we borrowed only from strategies that had been proven effective in other southern conservative states, and that's what we did. But we worked with the sheriffs and the DAs all the way through and business interests and so forth. And I think that they appreciate that approach, the collaborative approach. And I have been, um, I've had my, my door open to, to uh, the sheriffs uh, all four years, and I just think that that makes a difference. Lewis in Baton Rouge. Hello, Lewis. You're on the air with Governor Edwards and Sean Wilson. Yes, hello. How are y'all doing? Hello, Governor. How are you doing? Lewis, doing fine. Thank you. I'm calling, Governor, I'm calling in reference to the flood of 2016. Yes, sir. And the duplication of benefits. It's been three years, and I have not been able to eat a meal in my house in three years. Uh, I'm, I'm caught in duplication of benefits. I haven't received any money from anywhere. Um, first of all, Lewis, this is what I want you to do before you, before you hang up. Give Jace your 
your name, your address, and if you have um, registered with the Restore program, your, your registration number. Uh, the, the Congress, um, I think it was last um, October, um, made some, October the 5th, a bill was signed into law that kind of changed the way uh, duplication of benefits was, was going to be um, uh, enforced or interpreted by HUD. Uh, and then it wasn't until uh, June of this year that they actually issued guidance. Uh, we fairly quickly submitted a state action plan amendment that was required in order to, impl to implement the, that guidance. They have about 45 days to approve it. We're still waiting for it to be approved. But there will be a number of homeowners, and in fact already have been, because one of the things that we were able to do already is any on undrawn amount from the Small Business Administration, it no longer counts as a duplication of benefits. Um, and then there are other changes that we are trying to, to, to be able to make, but we have to get HUD approval. Uh, and, and so what I need you to do is give us that information. I will have someone from the Restore program contact you directly to see whether any of these changes have already uh, uh, made you eligible for assistance or that maybe will make you eligible for assistance if and when mm -hmm. HUD approves that state action plan amendment. Charlie in Baton Rouge. Hello, Charlie. You're on Ask the Governor. Good afternoon, Charlie. Okay. JC, let's see if we can get Charlie. I think he's there. He just uh, can't hear me. But, uh, and while we do that, uh, we'll go to AJ in Donaldsonville. Hello, uh, AJ in Donaldsonville. You're on the air with Governor Edwards. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Governor. Hi, AJ. Uh, First of all, I, I would like to wish you well in your upcoming election. Thank you, sir. I am a supporter of yours, and I will be casting a ballot for you. Uh, but, Governor, I belong to a group called ROAD, an acronym that stands for Real Opportunity Awaiting Diversion. That diversion is of traffic west of Port Allen from I-10 behind Port Allen, Plaquemon, Donaldsonville, White Castle, connecting with Highway 3127 all the way to Highway 90. That road would create an evacuation route for New Orleans uh, in, in the event of another terrible storm. Uh, it would also create a, a, a development, a commercial development zone all the way along, giving some advancement to the west side parishes uh, of the river parishes. Also, right now, with the expense that's being spent on the east side of the river from Baton Rouge down through Ascension Parish, uh, that's for managing traffic. What needs to happen is to eliminate some of that traffic going through Baton Rouge and Gonzales. Um, so, AJ, this is Secretary Wilson. Um, that a concept and approach is something that we have looked at and are advancing, and in fact, the governor signed uh, HB 578, which I think is the beginning of that with the LA 415 connector. Um, this current uh, iteration of it will tie I-10 to LA-1 uh, across the canal, but it also provides an opportunity to continue down that path. That's a part of the long-term um, south quarter bypass, if you will, from I-10 uh, on the west side. So the master plan uh, back in the day included 3127 and four-laning that and growing uh, opportunity on the West Bank. Um, and we think there's an opportunity to do that, but it's an expensive endeavor. The longer it takes, uh, the harder it gets. But we're making that first uh, foray into the west side with that 415 connector, as well as having the plans uh, soon to be ready and completed for the uh, intercoastal bridge on LA-1. That is about $125 million to replace uh, both of those structures. So we've got the plan together. It's just a matter of us really sticking to it and making a difference. Earlier, you mentioned uh, Garvey bonds, and that's been kind of a creative way to provide financing for some of these projects. How do they work? Well, uh, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but but uh, they've been a available for about 20 years. The state of Louisiana had never taken advantage of them, but they give you an opportunity to bond out your transportation trust fund uh, revenue that comes from the federal government. And so we've chosen to bond out 10% of that revenue for 12 years. Mm -hmm. That gives us the, the revenue all at one time to do some capacity projects that you would just never be able to deliver. So the bridge to the split widening of I-10 here in Baton Rouge, 
the, um, the new interchange at the airport in Kenner off of I-10, and then the I-20 uh, Barksdale interchange up in Bossier. Uh, so that's, that's how that works. And then as you, as you get the projects completed, you create new capacity, and then you just do your next series of Garvey bonds. And, and Sean, yeah, that, there's, you, you nailed it. There's okay. nothing to add other than it's an innovative tool. We're doing the right kinds of projects. And because of the condition of our transportation trust fund doing this, will allow us actually to spend more money in the rural areas out of our regular program because the bonded money is actually going to increase mm -hmm. what we're spending on the interstate. So the real magic is putting the pieces together, and the governor nailed exactly what it is. Uh, it's responsible. It's not a 30-year or 45-year debt. It's a 12-year debt for infrastructure that's going to last 55, 60 years. Well, we're short on time, and unfortunately, we won't be able to get to the remaining callers, but uh, the governor will be back next month, and as mentioned, he will either be reelected or he will be in a runoff. And Let's hope that uh, people vote. Last time in 2015, only 40% of the electorate uh, voted in the governor's election, and we take our politics personally in Louisiana. Governor, I'm sure you're suggesting that everybody get out I, I, and I cast do, a ballot. I do encourage people to vote. I, I just think it's important, and, and I think elections have consequences, obviously. And so I encourage everybody to, to make sure that they study the, the candidates and the issues and then go out and vote. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for listening.